up on this edition of 219 West. Picking a mayor to manage a troubled economy. Can going green cure the Wall Street blues? Also, she looks like daddy's little girl. Can this political neophyte take on one of the big boys? And we will meet some of the more flamboyant mayoral wannabes. When one of them fleshes out his platform, he means it, literally. Hello, and welcome to the first edition of 219 West, a monthly news magazine produced by the students of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm Aisha Muslim. And I'm John DePietro. So why 219 West? It's simple, really. That's where we are. 219 West 40th Street in Manhattan, just a few blocks off Times Square. Those numbers that appear under our logo, they are our geographic coordinates. 219 West once was home to the famed New York Herald Tribune. At the Trib, reporters crafted their stories by clicking away on typewriters. Today, students at the CUNY J School research, write, and edit the news of the day, all from their laptops. In keeping with the spirit of the Herald Tribune, our journalists branch out from 219 West to neighborhoods across all five boroughs. Our assignment? To provide in-depth coverage of stories frequently missed by the mainstream media. On this edition of 219 West, we focus on the city's general election on November 3rd, less than a month away. The main event is the contest for mayor, with incumbent Michael Bloomberg facing comptroller William Thompson. There are other candidates, and we'll talk about some of them a little later. Last October, Mayor Bloomberg persuaded the city council to change the law to allow him to run for a third term. Bloomberg argued that the economic crisis demanded continuity at City Hall and his personal financial experience. Building on what we've done for the last eight years really can make a heck of a difference. We need an affordable city. Talking about a city made up of working people with dreams and aspirations. All elections are about the future, influenced by the past. This past primary election day, 219 West reporters went to some voting places to ask voters what they would like New York City to be like four years from now. I think overall um, a more friendly city to not just middle class, which is that's a common buzzword everyone says, but to um, just more availability of culture, development, jobs, economic development, um, so that we're skewed less toward the super rich taking over the entire island and outer boroughs now. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's that's one of the most pressing things locally for me. Well, hopefully New York uh, keeps the trajectory it's been on in terms of being safe, lower crime, general prosperity, good employment, but hopefully there's also more affordable housing and it's more economically diverse. There is an old saying, when Wall Street sneezes, America catches a cold. But for New York City, when Wall Street sneezes, we get pneumonia. Last year, when Bloomberg began his push for a third term, Wall Street and the financial sector were in grave condition. 219 West reporter Geneva Sand Sadowitz has been looking at how the mayor and others diagnosed New York City's economy and some prescriptions for its cure. The New York City economy has had a difficult year. The unemployment rate spiked higher than the national average. Job losses on Wall Street have contributed to a steep drop in tax revenues. Even the Federal Reserve says the city may not yet have hit bottom. City government is working hard now to replace the jobs that have been lost and to put New Yorkers back to work again. One of Mayor Bloomberg's plans to help New York City through its troubles is to diversify the economy. Diversification may seem like a wonky policy term. But in simple terms, it means don't put all your eggs in one basket. You don't want to have 
all of your jobs depended on one sector. And New York has um, long had um, a real over-reliance on the financial services sector. Jonathan Bowles at the Center for an Urban Future has been advocating this for years. Most of the time when you talk about diversif diversification uh, of industries, you're talking about jobs. Um, you know, how many jobs a certain sector has. But in this case, the real danger of Wall Street for New York is that we rely on it way too much for the income it provides for the tax revenues. In New York City, when you look at industries in terms of how many people they employ, no one industry dominates. However, in terms of tax revenue, the finance and insurance sector supplied New York City with 32 percent of all wages last year. The numbers have stayed more or less the same over the past eight years. For example, in 2001, the finance and insurance industry accounted for 30 percent of all wages. We think it's great that the financial services sector did as well as it did. The deputy mayor for economic development has no apologies for the money flowing from Wall Street. The problem is when that sector goes down, what are the sectors around that will help pick it up? We want to continue to maintain our role as the dominant financial services provider in the world, but we also want to have other engines, if you will. The Bloomberg administration considers entrepreneurs key players in the game of diversification. Alyssa Olin is one of them. She is also capitalizing on a growing interest in the green sector. We're an eco-friendly home goods store located in Clinton Hill, and we just opened on Earth Day of this year. Olin and her family were having trouble finding eco-friendly products for the home. Her solution was to start her own business. It wasn't easy. I think one of the most difficult aspects of opening uh, brick and mortar like Green in Brooklyn is um, in a place like New York is that Prices are high. You need money to do it, and it's, it's usually a lot of money. The beauty of the city is there are so many resources. Um, the problem is having enough time and energy to track them down and take advantage of them. Some businesses, like Olin's Green in Brooklyn, do find help. But high rents, limited space, and a boom time economy all contribute to reducing dependence on Wall Street. When Wall Street booms, it's impossible to do anything but ride the boom. It just isn't, it isn't within the power of a mayor. You know, it's not like city government dictates the economy. City government has a very limited role in influencing and shaping the economy. Greg David of Cranes, New York, still thinks New York City has a long way to go. We think we've diversified. If we, you look around, we've got a big tourism industry. Um, Health care has become incredibly important. But you know, in the end, we did not diversify. Still, he acknowledges that Mayor Bloomberg has helped this effort through plans such as rezoning the industrial waterfront. The fundamental question facing the New York City economy is whether Wall Street is just going to bounce back and we're going to ride the boom back up, or whether Wall Street's not going to bounce back and therefore we face a much less wealthy future, and if we do, what we're going to do about it and whether we can diversify the economy. It remains to be seen how many eggs will be left in the financial basket when New York emerges from its current downturn. The city's financial crisis shaped the current mayor's race, and it's almost certain to shape the next four years. For 219 West, I'm Geneva Sansadowitz. Next, the follow-up from the term limits debate, the outlook for the city's economy, and campaign spending. Is it too much of a good thing? First, what some primary voters think about changing term limits. Well, I was disappointed that he made that change and uh, would have preferred that there had been an opportunity to bring it before the voters. But in fact, the last time this issue was brought before the voters, we said no, we didn't want to extend term limits. I object to term limits in general for anything. I think they're inherently undemocratic. Uh, so, you know, there may be some objections about the way he went about extending term limits. But it doesn't really bother me because I don't think they should be there in the first place. If you don't like the guys, just vote them out. As we have reported, New York City is slowly coming out of the recession. The mayor has argued the hard times demand his continued leadership. His successful campaign to change the term limit law was based on that. That and other issues are what we want to talk about with John Schumel, host of The Call on New York One. We know him best as Professor Shumo. He is an adjunct in the broadcast faculty at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Aisha, John, thank you both for having me, and congratulations on the launch of your new program. Thank, thank you. you. Well, first of all, we want to start. What are your callers saying about 
the race between Bloomberg and Thompson. Does he have a chance? Uh, does Thompson have a chance, I guess is the question. Um, it depends on whom you ask. Uh, the polls say perhaps no. My callers say perhaps yes. Uh, we have to look at the perspective of who's calling into a, a news program, probably people who are motivated to call. Now, what motivates people to call? Maybe anger. Angry people get off the couch, get the phone, wait on hold to make their point. We don't know how many people are out there in the Thompson camp just yet. There's something called the silent majority. People are happy with the way things are going. They might not speak up. People who are unhappy typically do. We get a lot of calls, people upset with Mayor Bloomberg for a variety of reasons. So if you ask me based on my show, I'd say this is a very competitive race. And so these callers, are they, you know, are they expected to then go out and vote? Do you think that can change anything? Angry people might be motivated to vote, too. Uh, one would think, and perhaps one would hope for the sake of democracy, that they are motivated. We all should be motivated. But people have been uh, very, very upset with Mayor Bloomberg, specifically for overturning term limits without a public referendum. And his poll numbers took a hit immediately after that. And they... They've, they've stayed lower. Uh, they're creeping back up a little bit now, re most recently, but uh, the mayor and the city council uh, overturned the will of the people, and that message has been sent very clear to me through my viewers. They are, uh, people were upset. I'd often ask the question, do you like Mayor Bloomberg? And people would say yes. Would you have voted for him if he had offered you the chance to overturn term limits, and you said yes. In other words, if you if they did it the right way, would you have voted for Mayor Bloomberg? Yes. Are you going to vote for him now? No. People were upset about how it happened, more so than about who did it and why, from my from my perch. So term limits is still still resonating with people a year later. They're they're still resonating within the voters, and that's gonna that that may affect it's, this this race. Absolutely. And it was, if the fire was going out, it was stoked by the fiasco in the state Senate, uh, which took place where the state senators basically decided to, the Republicans had a coup, and, and we all know the story it has been told, and uh, suddenly Albany shut down for the better part of a month, maybe longer. And people were once again reminded of the, the, the politicians making decisions that affect the three of us, but yet we have no long, we have no say. And if the term limits fire was was burning out, it it, it was you know the Albany lawmakers poured some gasoline on it inadvertently maybe. But look at the least the recent elections with uh, the public advocate and with the city controller, uh, David Yasky lost. John Liu won. David Yasky voted with Mayor Bloomberg. John Liu voted against extending term limits. So was that the deciding factor? I don't know. I didn't interview everybody who voted. But when we talked about the Liu Yasky race, it came up more than once. And Bill de Blasio, a city councilman who led a lawsuit against overturning term limits, won as public advocate. Uh, so the two people who were left in the race, who were against extending term limits, both won. Now, that could be a coincidence. But based on what I've been hearing from my viewers, I think that term limits is playing a role in this election. So how do people feel about all the campaign ads and mailers that they receive from Mayor Bloomberg? They want to rip them up. Uh, and they've been, uh, we just did a show a couple of nights ago, in fact, and, and uh, the question we were asking folks is, how much are you paying attention? Because they were talking about low voter turnout in the primary. How much are you paying attention? to this campaign season. And I must have received dozens of emails from people saying, I can't not pay attention because my phone is ringing off the hook with the solicitors. My mailbox is filling up with brochures. And, you know, people don't, New Yorkers especially, don't necessarily like to be told what to do. We like guidance like everybody else, but New Yorkers, you know, we walk around with two chips on both shoulders and we don't want someone to tell me what to do. So, you know, we make up our minds for, for many reasons. 
a flyer in my mailbox is probably not going to convince me. A hundred flyers is probably going to annoy me. So, uh, but I would have some consultant somewhere must think it's a good idea, otherwise it wouldn't be happening. So we'll see what happens. So this is an example of maybe over campaigning, putting, putting the message out too much. If you are out spending, if you're out polling, why would you make such an effort to get your voice out there? You've got, you're the incumbent for eight years, you're running on your record, but yet you're still running like people don't know you. It's, to me, it doesn't make sense, but I don't have a couple hundred million dollars to burn, so. Thank you, John Schumo. Thank you, good luck. Thank you. One of the candidates in a city council race in Queens has two distinctions, his age and his political affiliation. 219 West reporter Nicole Torso has his story. Just a year ago, this man lived at home with his grandparents. He isn't even old enough to rent a car. Nonetheless, the Sozone Park native, born to a single mom, has been elected to represent roughly 77,000 people in the 32nd Council District in Queens. His name is Eric Ulrich. He's the youngest and newest member of the New York City Council. So help me God. Congratulations. The district covers southwestern Queens and part of the Rockaways and is nearly three to one Democratic. Ulrich, however, is a Republican. And that's not the only thing that makes him stand out. Um, and he is one of the youngest people ever to get elected to the city council. Ulrich won the seat in a nonpartisan special election after his predecessor, Joseph Adabo Jr., went to the state Senate in Albany. Although voter turnout was low, just about 10 percent, Ulrich won a plurality of the votes. But not for long. He'll have to run again in the general election in November. Perhaps because he was perceived as a short-timer, Ulrich managed to win over some voters who'd never pulled the lever for a Republican before, including lifelong Democrat David Quintana. Eric is a smart kid. I like him personally. His views are, you know, kind of far flung from mine. But I figured in the uh, for a special election with a new primary and election coming in November, he would be a safe uh, seat warmer for the seat. I guess. Ulrich says, anybody who figured that uh, figured agree. wrong. Uh, but I'm here to say that I'm not a bench warmer. I'm not a placeholder. I'm here to serve. And I'm here to serve. At one point, Ulrich says he thought he'd become a priest. But when I went to college, I realized that, you know, God had other plans. And I decided that there was still a way for me to serve the public and to serve a common good. You know, it's a blessing and a curse sometimes, but um, I realized that politics was an appropriate vehicle uh, for, for doing just that. So it was a natural transition. A priest and a politician have a lot in common. Ulrich has been assigned to four council committees transportation, environmental protection, higher education, and perhaps not a coincidence, the Committee on Youth. I don't know if that was a pun or a joke on the part of the speaker, but maybe they thought that I had a unique insight into the youth of the community. But Ulrich turns serious when he talks about his age. I don't think that we should discriminate people based upon age. I think that if somebody is capable or competent at doing a job, then they should be given a fair shot. Newspaper reporter Lee Landor covered the special election for the Queen's Chronicle. She says Ulrich didn't come across as a kid. I think it, you know, a lot of people are probably taken aback by him being only 24. But um, he doesn't act 24. He, he acts more like he's 40. Ulrich says he knows he's surprising people who've counted him out all his life. Those are the same people that said that I'll never win the special election, that I'm still wet behind the ears, I have too much to learn, I don't pay a mortgage, uh, you know, all these other crazy uh, things. Um, you know, I think that takes away from them more than it does uh, me. He'll almost certainly face a strong challenge from Democratic leader Frank Lucio, who was the front runner in the special election until he was kicked off the ballot on a technicality. And he says age does matter. Um, I have children of my own, and they're basically Eric's age. Um, 
love them dearly. Would I love them to run my business when I ran a very successful international company? Uh, they'd have to learn the business first before I could, allow them, I could allow them to run the business. My job is to be the councilman right now. His job is to be the candidate. To suggest for some second that because, you know, he's three times my age and that uh, because he had a business or that he's been involved in the clubhouse longer than I have that I'm inept to do my job. I don't think that that's fair. Ulrich says he spends most of his working hours in his district with constituents, not with what he calls the fat cats at City Hall. That was 219 West reported in Cold Torso. Supporters of term limits argue that it opens up the political process, giving opportunity to lots of new faces to enter the political scene. One of this year's political newcomers is a young woman without any political connections running as a Democrat in a Republican district. 219 West's Rima Abdelkader had a chance to catch up with this newcomer on her campaign. Rima? That's right, John. Janine Materna seeks to represent the south shore of Staten Island in the city council. It's her childhood dream. The term used to describe a campaign headquarters is the boiler room. For Janine Materna, her boiler room is her dining room. You're the girl on the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old are you? <laughs> well, she's 30, and I she don't no, look no, at Every day is, is a different challenge and a different goal that you need to meet. Um, when people say, oh, you're a little too young to be running, I, I remind them of my background and how I've lived my life here in Staten Island, how I live the issues. Yes. Okay, I went to school with him. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about all the young people who were, have been very influential in society, like JFK, who is a very young president, um, there's a lot of young people who have made tremendous strides in society at a young age and have just built their career off of that. I don't want to be associated with being too young to do the job because um, I'm not. Uh, I... Let's go. Let's go campaign. I wake up very early in the morning. I probably get up around 5.30 to prepare for my day to either be up on, on the trains or the buses by 6 or 6.30. When I was growing up here, I knew my neighbors and my classmates all very well. It felt more like a small town. Throughout the years, I've seen the area become overdeveloped. There's traffic, there's congestion wherever you go. This is one of the things I like about Tottenville. This is a, a candy shop and ice cream parlor. Tottenville make more areas like this in Staten Island, more of that small town feeling. My vision is for the South Shore of Staten Island to look more like Red Bank, New Jersey. Um, have beautification areas where we have lampposts and cobblestone streets and ice cream parlors and candy shops and a wine bar and a jazz area. So I am pro-development, but I'm pro-smart growth, growth that actually makes sense for the, the South Shore of Staten Island, not just growth that makes sense to make money. Absolutely. When I was, when I was a very little girl, four or five years old, even younger than that, I remember my mom taking me into the voting booth and being so amazed by the voting process. This is my mother, um, who's always been there for me and has allowed me to actually use the dining room as the campaign headquarters to kind of get things off the ground and running. It's very, very emotional, especially when your whole family is involved. I mean, uh, my sisters are involved, my parents are involved, and it becomes very important because not only it becomes emotional and um, very sentimental because they want to see me succeed, but those are my most trusted advisors that I can really rely on. Every time we think we can't do something, we put our minds to something and say we can do it. An example of that is when I was asked to get 900 petition signatures. I said, geez, how can I get 900 signatures? This is impossible, absolutely impossible. Okay. For the election, how to get the You know, I don't know her. Uh, she's running against uh, Ignizio, I guess. And uh, he's tough, you know, he works very hard. Um, but, you know, I did the same thing when I first ran. Uh, I ran in a primary, and uh, here I am so many years later, uh, 27 years in public office. Nice to meet you. Me Hopefully I'll have your support this November, okay? okay? From my opponent, what distinguishes me is a few things. For one, I really want this job. I believe that what I've done to date, he's never done before. He's never had to go out there and, and knock from door to door. Uh, more funding for children with disabilities, especially... This is the woman you should vote for. The person she's running up against, Ignizio, there's a lot of talk, no action. Another challenge is sometimes not being respected, um, being a woman with an education. I've been receiving some of that from some older gentlemen in the areas. Well, I, I ran across one gentleman and he goes, you should be in the kitchen cooking. 
or you know you should be having a baby by now and I'm not saying that I don't want that. Eventually, I do want that. Count on your support then, sir? Yes. Okay, thank you. Can I count on your support, ma'am? Yes. I'm also the only woman on the ballot. We need to have more women in politics. No, I see, said. that's okay. the wrong thing to say. Just <laughs> go by your credentials. Okay. Go with your credentials. Sure, sure both, You'll right? do fine. Okay. The person on the ballot, that's the thing. Okay. So, Rima, Materna has no political connections whatsoever. How did she get involved in the political process? She went to her local library and took out a book, How to Run for Local Office by Robert Thomas, and just followed his advice. It's a great story, Rima. Aisha? On November 3rd, as many as seven names could be on the ballot for New York City mayor, a political office once called the second toughest job in America. We hear a lot about the front runners, Bloomberg and Thompson. They get a lot of attention. But as 219 West Alana Regal found out, there are quite a few others who are likely to attract attention, if not votes. So look who else is running for mayor. What would you say to this guy? Or this guy? These men are indeed running for mayor of New York City, as well as a few others. This is Johnny Pork Pie, and I am the burlesque mayor of New York City, and I'm running for the office of actual mayor of actual New York City. I'm Jimmy McMillan, the founder of the Rent is Too Damn High movement. And this is Reverend Billy Talent running on the Green Party ticket. Ask Johnny Porkby, founder of Pinch Bottom Burlesque in Brooklyn, to flesh out his platform, and you'll get flesh. I know New Yorkers. New Yorkers like nudity. New Yorkers need nudity, and New Yorkers deserve nudity. And if I'm elected mayor, I will give them that nudity. New York is a theatrical city. It deserves a theatrical mayor. He says the city is missing something. What I think New York needs at this point is a visionary, and I am that visionary. In fact, I drink enough that I'm a double visionary. Kenny Kramer, the real-life model for the Seinfeld character, runs a tour company. He's one of the main attractions. He also ran for mayor and says he almost won. The year I ran for mayor, there were 60,000 marijuana arrests in New York, and I could have put an end to that. And and I'll tell you, I could have won the New York mayoral race by a landslide if the dope smokers in New York would have just remembered to vote. That was the problem, getting them to actually put down their Twinkies and go to a poll. Jimmy McMillan represents the Rent is Too Damn High party. He says the Board of Elections tried to take damn out of his party's name. They could take the word damn out all they want, but we're going to continue this race as rent is too damn high no matter what. McMillan, a retired postal worker, says he decided to run for mayor after coming back from Vietnam. He tells people that rent isn't one of his only issues, but it's his main one. If you're paying attention, if you can't pay your rent, you are not going to be here. Johnny Porkby also says he's concerned with important issues like transit. I think if we put the T and A into the MTA, you won't have any more un unhappy commuters. Reverend Billy Talon is the Green Party candidate. As a pastor for the Church of Life after shopping, he preaches the gospel of anti-consumerism and peace. Who will you vote for mayor? Who do you think represents your city the best? Is your rent too damn high? Do you want to be able to be naked like this man? There were three words that defined my campaign. I would say those words are excellence, integrity, and ludicrousness. And that's the bottom line. For 219 West, I'm Alana Regal. And that's our first edition of 219 West. Thank you for being with us. I'm John DePietro. And I'm Aisha Al Muslim. In the coming weeks, our reporters will be heading out to neighborhoods all around the city to cover stories about people and issues in all five boroughs. We'll bring them to you in our next edition. And we hope you'll find your way back to us right here at 219 West. See you next time.